All right. Um, so thank you very much, Mark, for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you guys uh, today. Can people hear me? You guys at the back, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I tend to move around a little bit when uh, I talk, so just a uh, warning for that in advance. Um, so what I want to do today is just talk a pretty informally uh, to you guys about uh, some of the central aspects of uh, some of the work that I've done on disability, particularly about the relationship between disability and well-being. Um, and what I want to do is examine the question of what does it mean uh, for a person with a disability, especially in this case, I want to look at the, uh, the example of physical disability. What does it mean for a person with a disability to flourish? Um, can a person with a disability flourish just as much as anyone else? Can they live a life um, that is different than the lives of your average non-disabled people, but in an important sense is not less than, is not worse than, um, is not impoverished because of their disability. So with a little bit of background, one of the things that we find both if we look at empirical literature that we have from psychology and just if you look at testimony, if you read the huge uh, amounts of uh, narrative and memoir that we have from disabled people, if you go to a disability pride parade, Philadelphia has one of the biggest in the country, you should check it out sometime. Um, if you go to uh, a disability arts event, disability theater or, or that kind of thing, um, you will see a wide range of disabled people making claims about their life and about the quality of their lives that a lot of non-disabled people find surprising. Uh, so the first of these is that a lot of non-disabled people find surprising is that most disabled people rate themselves as having relatively good quality of life. Um, and typically when you ask non-disabled people what they predict that disabled people will say about their quality of life, they predict that disabled people will say that they have relatively low quality of life um, or that they're substantially worse off. Um, and this tends to not be um, what disabled people say. Uh, what disabled people say is that they have pretty good quality of life. Um, now, I want to be really careful in saying this to emphasize that I'm not saying that disabled people don't say there's difficult things about being disabled, say there's hard things about being disabled. No, of course. Um, but disabled people tend to rate themselves as having pretty good quality of life. There's also more than that. If you go um, to events that um, are immersed in what we often call the disability community, um, if you go to a disability pride parade or if you go to um, a disability rights event, what you will see is a lot of people saying more than just, I'm happy, more than just, I'm okay. Um, you will see people making claims of the form, um, I like being this way. This is a good way to be. I am not worse off. I'm not automatically worse off than non-disabled people just because of whatever this thing is about my body. And in fact, um, many non-disabled people will make claims of the form, um, if given the chance, I wouldn't take the opportunity to become non-disabled. I wouldn't trade my disability to become non-disabled. Um, so there's a very uh, influential piece of work by the sociologist Harlan Hahn, who is himself disabled, and he did a survey amongst um, members of the community organizing group, ADAPT. So I don't know if any of you guys have seen the footage uh, on the news recently of disabled people protesting in the halls of Congress and the Senate and getting ripped out of their wheelchairs. Um, that's ADAPT. Um, those, uh, those people, is a highly politicized uh, group of disabled people, um, it's ADAPT that sponsored those protests. So uh, Harlan Hunt did a survey of ADAPT members and he asked them, if you were given a pill that instantly removed your disability and had no side effects, so this is the, this is the magic cure. 
um, that is sought for but doesn't exist, right? And so if you could take a pill that would instantly remove your disability but have no side effects, would you take it? And the majority of people, more than half of the people that he surveyed um, in ADAPT said no, they wouldn't take it. Um, and the majority of people who said that they would take it said the primary reason they would take it was social stigma against disability, not anything intrinsic to the disability. Um, so it is not uncommon for disabled people to say something more than just, I'm happy. Um, it's not uncommon for disabled people to say something like, this is a good way to be. I don't wish I was otherwise. I wouldn't want to be other than how I am. And I think this is something that a lot of non-disabled people have a hard time understanding. Honestly, I think it's something that a lot of disabled people have a hard time understanding because the narratives that we have for understanding what it means to flourish as a disabled person, to live a good life as a disabled person, are all about finding a way to offset the badness of the disability. So it's like, you've got a disability and that's bad, that's unfortunate. How are you going to make it, make up for that in other ways? So how are you going to be happy nevertheless? happy in spite of. Um, the wonderful disability rights lawyer and activist and author Harriet McBride Johnson talked about uh, the ways in which people always wanted to understand her as happy in spite of her disability, um, rather than simply happy. People could never understand her as simply happy. She had to be happy in spite of. Uh, we have these narratives about disability where um, either you're the, you're the tragic overcomer, so if something horrible happened to you and then you've managed to push through, um, you've managed to be inspiring. Um, you see these narratives a lot every time the Paralympics comes around. Um, the Paralympics is full of tragic overcomer narratives. Um, in disability circles, we all can call this inspiration porn. Um, so <laughs> the idea of uh, disabled people as being especially inspiring because they've, they've overcome so much. Um, the idea of disab disabled people as having learned important lessons about toughness or perseverance. Um, a lot of religious narratives about disability have an element of this. So St. Paul's thorn in the flesh um, that was sent to teach him an important lesson, a test of faith, a test of struggle and you know, learning to rely on God because you can't rely on your, uh, you know, your weak flesh. Um, <coughs> Tiny Tim is another great example, right? So Tiny Tim, who has developed this beatific patience in the face of his disability. So these are the ways that we tend to understand flourishing disabled people. It's about making up for the bad thing. It's about overcoming the bad thing. It's about happiness in spite of the bad thing. And that doesn't really line up with what a lot of disabled people say about themselves and about their lives. It doesn't line up with disabled people who say, do you know what, I wouldn't rather be otherwise. I'm not saying I'm happy in spite of, I'm saying I'm just happy. Um, and I think there's so much of a disconnect here that it's actually sometimes genuinely difficult for non-disabled people to understand what disabled people are saying when they say that they're just happy and they wouldn't want to be otherwise. Um, and sometimes I think maybe non-disabled people just don't believe disabled people when they say this. They think, oh, that's maybe wishful thinking. That's maybe adaptive preference. It's sort of, it's nice that you would say that, but we all know that's not true. Right? Um, my, actually my, I think one of the most vivid examples of this comes from the work of Harriet McBride Johnson, um, who was mentioning, she makes this claim about happy nevertheless. She wrote a beautiful article that I would recommend you all read in New York Times Magazine called Unspeakable Conversations. Um, and a lot of it is about her experience finding it difficult to talk to people about her life and about her flourishing. 
because people don't understand. And she says, I've stopped trying because people don't want to know. And it's in this article that she makes the claim about how people find it hard to think of her as merely happy. They always say that she has to be happy in spite of. Um, people find it hard to understand her as a flourishing person um, in her own right. Uh, a few years after she wrote this beautiful, poignant article where she's incredibly explicit about this, uh, Harriet McBride Johnson died, and the New York Times published an obituary for her. And part of the reason that they published the obituary is that this article that she wrote in the New York Times had been so influential. And they titled it, Happy Nevertheless. <laughs> um, so she was right, right? People didn't believe her. She predicted that she wouldn't be believed, and uh, she was right. Um, and I'm sure that whoever titled the obituary that did not do it on purpose, right? They weren't intentionally trying not to believe her. That's just their only way of understanding her claims was as happy nevertheless. And I think a big reason why people find these kind of claims confusing is uh, people don't understand what it would look like to say that disability could just be a way of being different, have a life, having a life that's somewhat abnormal, somewhat uh, a departure from the norm, but just as good, um, not less than, not having a disability isn't something that automatically makes you worse off. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that very often we tend to think of disability simply in terms of lack or in terms of loss. So um, the normal person can hear uh, and the deaf person can't. So deafness is just the absence of hearing. Uh, the normal person can walk. A person with a spinal cord injury, a complete spinal cord injury, can't. Um, so their disability is just the absence of that spinal cord function, absence of the ability to walk. Um, it gets complicated when you have more complicated disabilities, but generally we think there's, there's always something, right? Um, the normal person can walk around without a mobility aid. I can't, so what you would focus on if you focus on my disability is the fact that, that I have this, this lack, that I need something that other people don't need. Right. Um, so, we then say, all right, well, um, surely, surely it's good to be able to see. Think about all the good benefits that you get from seeing. Like, I like seeing. I don't know if you guys like seeing. Um, so I like looking at beautiful art. I like going to Shenandoah National Park and looking at beautiful sunsets and natural vistas. I like visually appreciating the faces of my loved ones. And all of these things are good. All of these things seem good to me. So I think what a lot of people think that they're being asked to do is adopt this sort of radical subjectivism when they say, no, well, none of that is good. None of that is good. It's just, you might like it, but it's, it's not good. Um, it would be, there's, there's nothing necessarily good about these experiences because we have to say that if we say um, that it's not worse to be blind because the blind person lacks all these experiences. Um, I don't think we need to say that. Um, we can absolutely say that it's great to be able to see, it's great to be able to visually appreciate the faces of your loved ones, it's great to be able to look at a beautiful sunset and think that's beautiful. All of that's great. Without saying that blind people are automatically worse off by not being able to participate in those things, by not having those abilities. Um, the first reason why I think we can say this is just that we don't in general think that it follows from thinking that as an ability is good to thinking that you're harmed by lacking that ability. Um, I think, does anyone here not know who Simone Biles is? Um, so I think it's awesome that Simone Biles can do what she can do. I think it's fantastic. I think it's a testament to human achievement and I think maybe gravity is different around her. Um, I love watching Simone Biles perform. Um, I don't personally feel like I am worse off because I can't do backflips. 
Um, I think most people, when they watch Simone Biles, think that's great, but don't feel like they are personally worse off um, in virtue of not being able to do backflips. Even stronger, I don't feel like my life would be better if I could do backflips. I don't. I have no particular interest in doing gymnastics um, or pursuing gymnastics. I don't think my quality of life would be enhanced by being able to backflip. I have no interest in that. Um, I think it's fantastic that Simone Biles can do it. Uh, I don't feel I'm harmed by not being able to do it. But of course, Simone Biles is a bit of an extreme case. And I think what a lot of people will say will say, yeah, but that's, that's not. It's not normal. There's a difference between ex the extreme range of excellence and then what we would consider normal. Um, there are lots of abilities that we think of as normal, and we also don't think you're harmed by lacking them. Uh, so here's something I can do that I think, as abilities go, is pretty awesome. Uh, I can grow a new person in my body. Um, and then once I've grown that person, I can use my own body's nutrients to feed it for quite some time. Um, as abilities go, that's an impressive one. Um, I've never done it, but I could. <laughs> um, um, it's pretty important for the species. Um, the cisgender men in the room, y'all can't do that. Sorry. Um, you, can, you do not, sorry? Uh, you do not have this ability. My impression, sociologically, is that most men do not feel that they are dramatically harmed by lacking this ability. They don't go through life feeling impoverished by lacking this ability. We can grant that an ability is good while thinking, actually, generally, men can do OK. Like, we don't, in general, talk about men as being happy in spite of, um, or happy nevertheless. That's not how we talk about the flourishing of men, um, or the flourishing of male bodies. It is important to note, there actually are online support communities for um, people who are biologically male and desperately want to be pregnant um, and feel that they're harmed by this. This is an uncommon thing, but it does happen. Um, so it might be that um, some people are harmed by it, but some it might depend on what you want, um, what your desires are. Um, so we can grant that an ability is good, impressive, wonderful, valuable without saying that you are automatically worse off by lacking that ability. The other big thing I think it's important to say here is that it is an impoverished way of thinking about disability to think of disability just as the lack of an ability. Disability is so much more than the lack of an ability. Right? If you have a disability, it fundamentally structures the way you move through the world, the way you experience the world. Um, how you navigate the world. And there are lots of ways in which that affects your experience, and that affects your experience in so much more than just specific things that you can't do. Um, and I think non-disabled people tend to focus on the lack because that's what's salient to them. And there's other things that they don't focus on because they're either ignorant of those things or those things aren't particularly salient to them and aren't salient to their experience. So let's grant right, that those of us who can see like seeing. Um, and there are things about our experience as sighted people that we like, that we value, that we think are good. Visually appreciating the faces of our loved ones, or um, being able to navigate a room by sight without thinking about it. Like, all of these things are things that we can value. Um, and that it makes sense to value, think are good. Um, there is a wonderful blind activist and storyteller named Kim Kilpatrick who ran a blog uh, for a year called Great Things About Being Blind. Every day she did a new entry on something that she loved about being blind. Um, and some of these entries were just so fantastic and they were the kind of thing that if you're not blind you wouldn't necessarily think about it until somebody pointed it out to you. Um, so some of the things that Kim Kilpatrick says she values about being blind. Um, she is a woman in her 20s who has 
absolutely no concept of what it would be like. Not even that she doesn't experience this, she has no concept of what it would be like to be self-conscious about her appearance. Think about that for a minute, ladies. Um, she does not understand what it would be like to be self-conscious about her appearance or what she looks like. Um, she has never felt the urge to stop and check the mirror or wonder if she looks okay or any of that before leaving the house. Um, she is, by her own account, unable to racialize people. Um, she, can't, she knows she's been told what races are, and she understands that sometimes there's a vocal register, but she's unable to track it. Um, she's been told that there's, there's a vocal register, but she doesn't have enough information. I guess without the visual clues, she can't pick up on it. Um, so she can't racialize people. Um, she can't form a sort of, there's all that terrifying psychology, uh, psychological evidence about how quickly we stereotype people immediately as soon as we meet them and form preconceptions of what they're going to be like based on what they look like. She can't do that. Um, she does not form preconceptions of what someone's going to be like based on what they look like. Um, and she can't form look-based stereotypes. Um, and she's never been deceived by someone because they were just too good looking. Um, and so fallen for Dazzle. Um, she also talks a lot about her relationship with her guide dog um, and the amazing bond that she has with her guide dog. Okay. So all of these are ways in which her life has been enriched. Her life has been added to by her experience of being blind. Um, and just as there are things that you and I value about seeing, um, there are things that she values about being blind. And so she doesn't have to say that the things that you and I value about seeing aren't valuable uh, to say that her experience is not lesser. All she has to say is that her experience is different, but it's valuable too. And it's certainly just an incomplete picture to think of her experience as just the absence of sight. Because I think how we tend to think about disability is we think just take a normal person and then sub subtract some. Um, and we think, oh sure, I can know what it would be like to be blind, I'll just close my eyes. This sucks. Um, <laughs> that's not what it's like to be blind. Um, that's not the experience of a person who is blind and the, ex the social experience of a person who is blind goes so far beyond just not being able to, think, to do the things that you like to do that are associated with seeing. It's a much deeper experience than that. Um, the other thing that I think that people worry about when it comes to saying that disability is valuable is they think that that would commit them to saying something like, there are no bad things associated with disability, or at least, um, and this is actually a claim that some disability activists have made, uh, having to claim that all the bad things that are associated with disability are just the result of prejudice against disabled people. So the bad effects that come from being disabled are the results uh, are the result of prejudice against disabled people. They are not intrinsic to experience the experience of having an impairment. Um, so there's a view that sometimes gets called the social model of disability. Um, there's actually a wide family of views that fall under the label, the social model of disability, but I think the view that sometimes characteristically gets held up as the social model of disability is the view that says disability is what's caused by social prejudice against people with impairments. And in the absence of that, social prejudice, impairments would maybe, you know, they could sometimes be a nuisance or something like that, but they wouldn't be. Um, so I think the, the sociologist Colin Barnes, uh, no relation, uh, says uh, they, would, they would simply be a nuisance, but they wouldn't be life-altering. Um, and I think a lot of people, both disabled and non-disabled alike, have, have found that position to extreme. Um, have found that it doesn't resonate with the lived experience of disability. Um, that surely sometimes there are just things about being disabled that are hard, that are difficult, that are painful. 
emotionally or physically, especially when we look at the wide spectrum of physical conditions that we consider disabilities. Um, some of them require ongoing complex medical care. Some of them are progressive. Some of them are painful. Um, and living with a body that is like that is complicated. And the lived reality of a lot of people's experience is that it's hard. Um, and sometimes it hurts. And sometimes um, it's frustrating. And so I think a lot of people have worried that if we want to make this claim about being able to value disability, about being able to flourish as a disabled person, we have to sort of either deny that there really are these bad effects of disability, or we have to sweep them under the rug and be very quiet about them and only talk about them when only disabled people are present. Um, and that this somehow doesn't do justice to the practical reality of living with a disability. So we can make sense of the idea right, that in the absence of racism, there's not going to be any substantial bad effects of being any particular race. Um, the only thing that makes it bad to be a member of a particular race um, is racism. And we can also maybe accept that in the absence of homophobia, the only thing, um, there would be nothing that would make it bad or hard or complicated to be gay. I actually think that one's a little bit complicated because if you are gay, um, in the absence of advances in technology, you can't have a biological child with your partner. Um, and that might be something that would be hard for some people. It won't be for others, but it might be hard for some people. But we can at least understand and are comfortable with the idea that in the absence of homophobia, the suicide rate for gay teens would not be what it is. Um, in the absence of homophobia, it wouldn't be a struggle to be a gay person. The struggle comes externally. Um, the struggle is imposed. And then I think what a lot of people find, what a lot of people find themselves thinking when it comes to disability is surely some of the struggle, not all of it, a lot of it is imposed externally. A lot of it is imposed by lack of access to health care, by stigma, um, by shame, but some of the struggle is internal. Some of the struggle is just that there might be ways that your body could be that count as disabilities, but it's just kind of complicated to have a body that's like that. It's difficult. Maybe sometimes it's painful. Maybe sometimes it makes you tired. Maybe sometimes um, it wears you out. And so I think people have been reluctant or confused to talk about disabled people f flourishing, just not flourishing in spite of, just flourishing. Um, and the idea that a, a disabled life could just be different but not lesser, because there's this worry that it doesn't do justice to the full reality of what it can be like to live with a disability. Um, so in the last uh, 15 minutes, it's this idea that I want to talk about. Um, uh, because I think that we can absolutely do justice to the idea that disability doesn't automatically make you worse off. And that there are ways in which disability is a harm. Or ways in which disability can, uh, with respect to certain things or certain features, be bad for you. Um, at a particular time, with respect to a certain thing. Um, so I think the kind of view that we need to understand what it means to be a flourishing disabled people is the kind of view that has to allow for the fact that disability is a many splendored thing. Um, disability is complicated. Uh, and disability can often be the kind of thing that for a lot of disabled people can enrich your life, can make you such that you're not worse off, you wouldn't have been better off had you been non-disabled, you wouldn't want your disability taken away. This is a valuable part of human diversity and a valuable heart part of who you are. And yet, there are some things about it that are difficult. Um, and I think those things can both be true at the same time. And in fact, I think it's an utterly familiar claim about how we think about well-being, that those things can both be true at the same time. Um, 
Is anybody in the room, anybody in the room play sports on a sports team? Do any kind of sports? Great. Okay. Um, are there things about your sports, the pursuit of your sports, the practice of your sport, uh, that are sometimes kind of terrible, that you just really don't like yes. sometimes? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Always. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. This has got to be the universal experience of people who pursue sport at any kind of, like, especially at any kind of advanced level. Maybe if you just, like, play pickup soccer on the weekend for fun, right? But if you seriously train in a sport, there are going to be things about your training that you hate. Sometimes you hate your sport so much you can't even see straight. Sometimes when you, maybe you have that early morning practice and you get up and you go and you're just like, why do I do this to myself? What is wrong with my life and my choices? Um, there are things about the practice of most people's experience of sports that they don't like, that they really, really, really don't like, that are difficult. Right? Now, unless you're a sadomasochist, and I think some people who pursue sports are, um, but unless you're just a deep-seated sadomasochist or you're just doing it to make your daddy proud or something like that, most people who pursue sports pursue sports because they like it, because they enjoy it, because it's fun, because they wouldn't want their life to not contain that sport. Right? So there is an element about their practice of the sport where there are things about it they hate, just absolutely hate. Um, but at the same time, there are things about it that they love. Um, my sister is a runner. Um, and there are, right, there are people who jog, and then there are runners. <laughs> my sister is a runner. Um, she ran cross country all the way through college. She still runs. She's had two kids, and she the whole way through, she had like the the baby stroller with the the sort of ergonomic thing, so she can run, pushing the babies. Um, she gets up at like five o'clock in the morning to go running, um, and she's been running for most of the time I have known her, um, and to this day, there are things about running she just hates. She hates some parts of running. Um, she's not a morning person. Right? So she hates getting up really early in the morning. Um, and she pretty much hates the first five minutes of every run. Once she gets going, she's fine. But that first five minutes is just torture. She just hates it. Um, she gets blisters. She gets shin splints. Um, she had a chronic stress fracture for a while. She just, all this, this kind of stuff that happens to runners um, that she just absolutely doesn't like. So she's one of, if you hang out with runners at all ever, they will spend a lot of their time complaining about running. Um, but at the same time, so there are aspects of her life, right? Where running fundamentally makes her life worse, right? The part of her that wants to sleep in, running makes her life worse. The part of her that wishes her feet didn't hurt, and she could buy normal shoes, running makes her life worse. Um, that first five minutes, that first five minutes of her run is the worst part of her day. And that five minutes would be a better five minutes if she wasn't running. Um, but there are many other parts of her life that running enriches. Um, she actually loves running in general, just the, she would not get the same benefit from rowing or cycling. She loves that feet on the pavement, the rhythm of it, the staccato just getting into the zone. Um, she loves the culture of running. You know, the, you get the Map My Run app that you insist on sharing with all your friends that don't care. Um, and going to the running store and getting the shoes and talking about the trail conditions and getting all the accessories and the stroller. She was very into the stroller. Um, all this kind of stuff. She loves the stress relief. She loves the fitness. She has a really stressful job. And she's like, oh, I couldn't do this job if it wasn't for running. Um, so there are things intrinsic to running that she loves. There are things, benefits that she gets that are instrumental from running that she loves. Such that 
on the whole, running makes her life better. And it's not that running's kind of bad for her, but then other stuff makes up for it. No, on the whole, the very same thing that makes her life worse with respect to some things, some features, also makes her life better with respect to other things and other features, um, such that overall her life is enriched by running. And her life is enriched by running while still totally allowing that there are some things about running that she hates and that are hard and that are difficult. Sometimes it's actually even not obvious that you can separate the benefits that she gets from the hardships. It's, they're all nicely woven in there together. It's complicated. Her relationship to running is complicated. Um, it's a little bit two-sided and Janice-based. I'm not sure she would like it as much if it didn't hurt as much. Um, runners are weird. Um, but the very same thing that is a harm is also a benefit, such that on the whole, our life goes better for her. But that doesn't make the harms any less real. It just means well-being's complicated. Things are complicated. Um, you guys, well, the undergrads in the room are too young to have hopefully had a lot of friends who have had children. Um, I'm right at the age where everyone I know is having children. Um, and my experience of people when they have children, especially as a somewhat cynical childless person myself, um, is that here's, here's what you get from new parents. You get an endless stream of getting told about how terrible it is to have children, especially in that first two years. They're just, they're exhausted, they're sleepless, they have a lot of stories involving poop. Um, and projectile vomit. Poop, poop and projectile vomit sometimes at the same time. Um, and they will just tell you, oh, like, they're so tired, they have no free time, they're just, and then you're like, so how is parenting? And they're like, oh my god, it's the most amazing thing ever. This has changed my life. Um, at the same time, right? At the very same time that they will spend all of their time complaining about being a parent, they will also tell you, um, being a parent is just the most amazing thing. Being a parent is life-changing, wouldn't trade it for the world. It's just completely changed my life forever. Right? Um, these kind of claims about well-being are utterly common, I think, and utterly normal. We are really familiar with things in our lives that are kind of a mixed bag when it comes to well-being. Um, they can be good without being all good. Um, they can be good on the whole while there's still being some things that are difficult about them, or painful about them, or uncomfortable about them. And sometimes, whether they're good for you on the whole, whether they overall make your life go better or worse, depends a lot on factors about you, your social situation, um, your personality, what you want, whether you have help, whether you have support, um, what your projects are, what your, um, what your interests are, what kind of things you're engaged in. Um, it's often very, 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 very hard to say of something, just in the abstract. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it going to make your life worse? Um, is it going to fail to make your life worse? Lives are complicated. Human lives are really complicated. And a lot of things when it comes to well-being, it's a mixed bag. It depends on what else you combine them with. And certainly a lot of things that we think of as good, or at least not worse than the alternatives, can come with some things that we don't, that we think might be bad. Um, we can think that there are things that can enrich your life, but involve an element of harm, involve an element of struggle. And you don't necessarily, you don't have to say that the harm is good. Uh, you don't have to deny the reality of the bad thing, or deny that it's bad, right? to say that 
overall, this feature can still make your life your better. Right? You don't have to say to new parents, right? actually, sleeplessness is fine. Sleeplessness, sleeplessness, if done in the service of an infant, is really for the good. Sleeplessness is not bad for you um, if done in the service of a screaming, crying baby. Um, no, of course you don't say that. You say, yeah, man, it, it's really terrible that you haven't slept in six months. Um, and you probably don't remember what it feels like to sleep. That's, that's man, I'm sorry. Great about your kid, though. Cute baby. Um, please post more photos on your social media platform of choice. Um, so we can say these, we can hold these things in our head at the same time, and it's not that hard. It's not that complicated. It is striking that we find it so hard when it comes to disability, that we really find it hard to understand what disabled people even mean when they say disability is on the whole something they value um, or something that isn't bad for them. And that the only way we seem to be able to understand this is in terms of happy nevertheless. When in other parts of our thinking, in other parts of our thinking about well-being, about the choices we make for ourselves and our lives, we're really good at thinking about, yeah, you know, well-being is complicated. Some things are a mixed bag. Things can be hard, difficult, have aspects that are really complicated, but yet on the whole, they don't make you automatically worse. Um, they don't make you automatically worse off. Just because something has aspects that are hard doesn't mean the only way you can live a good life with that thing is by struggling through it or overcoming it. And we don't talk about athletes solely in the language of the struggle, the tragic overcomer. We don't talk about parents solely in the language of the tragic overcomer. But that is how we talk about disabled people. Um, so I think if we want to understand flourishing for disabled people, we do need to do justice to the lived reality of disability. Um, and that disability can be hard, disability can be difficult, and for some people, they don't like it. They don't want to be disabled. They would prefer to be non-disabled. Um, and that that's all okay. And that's all consistent with saying it makes perfect sense for people who are disabled to value their disability, to say that they aren't worse off, to say that they wouldn't want to be cured. Um, and I think we can hold these things in our head at the same time um, and have it not be that complicated. And then it can give us a picture of flourishing for disabled people. Oh, on there. makes sense to say, sure, like runners are happy in, in spite of the shin splints, even if they might actually prefer to have fewer shin splints. Um, and I think that's not necessarily true for all runners. Some runners actually, um, Haruka Murakami has this great book called What I Talk About When I Talk About Running. And he does, uh, he's a novelist that does ultra long distance marathons. And one of the things he says in this book is, uh, for anyone who does these ultra endurance events, at the end of the day, part of what we like about it is the pain, and we wouldn't do it if it wasn't painful. Um, so I think it's probably not true for all runners, but for a lot of runners, yeah, look, they would, I'm sure my sister would love it if she had fewer shins once. Um, so I think we can absolutely, when talking about disability, say that people are, you know, disabled people are happy in spite of whatever thing it is that's causing them harm, right? Um, so they can be happy in spite of, you know, sometimes having to spend time in the hospital. 
um, they can be happy in spite of um, sometimes uh, having to miss out on things that they would like to participate in. They can be happy in spite of not being able to do some things that they might want to do. Um, I think the mistake is to move from that to, so they're happy in spite of being disabled. And that goes back to what I was talking about at first, where we, said, well, we tend to want to understand disability just in terms of lack and in terms of harm. And I think what disabled people often try to say is that, no, it's a lot more. It's just a complicated social experience. It's about what it's like to navigate the world with a body that's a little bit different than what the world says your body's supposed to be like, um, which just affects all kinds of your experiences. Um, so when talking about happy, nevertheless, or happy in spite of, it's the idea, and we're familiar with this idea as well, right? That sometimes you can be happy in spite of the fact that bad things have happened to you, right? Um, so a lot of times the narratives that we have about this are like if you've learned a valuable lesson or something like that. So you, um, you went through a really difficult breakup, but it taught you self-esteem. Right. Or you got a bad grade in that class uh, that you wanted to do well in, but it really taught you to buckle down. Right. So it's like, you, there was a bad thing, but the bad thing led to some good consequences. Um, and so we can say, oh yeah, you, you've done well in, in, in spite of, maybe sometimes you know, in a way that's causally correlated. Um, but if you could have gotten the good consequences and not, like if you could have just gotten the self-esteem and not had to go through the breakup, that would be the ideal way to do it, right? Um, so I think when, often when we talk about disability, we think of like, oh yeah, so you've, you've gained these valuable lessons in perseverance um, because you're disabled. Now, what would be awesome is if now we could take away your disability. Or what would be awesome is if you could have gotten that perseverance without having to be disabled or something like that. Um, whereas what a lot of disabled people say is like, no, <laughs> look, Part of my happiness consists in the experiences that I have that are directly related to my disability. Um, part of how I think about my flourishing is directly related to my experience as a disabled person. So when Kim Kilpatrick talks about things that she loves about her life, a lot of it is just directly a component of being blind. So we can say she's happy in spite of not being able to visually appreciate the faces of her loved ones. Or we can say she's happy in spite of finding it frustrating that Braille is not widely available. Um, but we shouldn't say she's happy in spite of being blind. Does that make sense? Perfect. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Weiss. In the study that you wrote with disabled people who would yeah. take the pill and give mm -hmm. away a disability, did that study look at differences of attitude of people when they became disabled? Is there a difference in attitude between people who perhaps have a congenital disability or just people who become disabled due to a you know, car accident or something like yes. that? Yes. Um, so this was one of um, one of the biggest predictors of whether someone would take the pill in Harlan Hong's study was how recently they had become disabled. Um, but it, the distinction didn't clearly track what we would think of as the congenital acquired distinction. Mm -hmm. It tracked something closer to uh, recently acquired. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think one of the, so one thing that uh, there's recent psychological work on that I, I personally find very interesting and I, I hope there's going to be more work on is the idea of disability identity. Um, so thinking of yourself as a disabled person and that being a part of your self-conception. Um, and turns out, at least we have evidence to suggest that disability identity is one of the biggest predictors of well-being in disabled people, at least subjective well-being. Um, and it does seem like disability identity is much easier to come by for people with congenital disabilities um, than for people with acquired disabilities. Um, especially because it's much more common, I think, for people with acquired disabilities to uh, have a more, I think, medicalized um, understanding of, of their disability. Um, but yeah, at least what we know so far, or what the evidence suggests so far, is that there is a fairly um, significant divide when it comes to disability identity between congenital and acquired. Thank you. 
Is it a, was it along any line of people studies done with people like over time as they, they, if they acquire a disability? Do people's attitude change or is it? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it varies. Yeah, um, so what we tend to see, um, and we need, we need more research on this, um, but what we tend to see is a fairly um, dramatic shift in the first five years. Um, and the, like the first five years are pivotal. So what we see is a process of adaptation. Um, and it doesn't happen for everyone. Um, it doesn't happen for everyone. Um, but very often you see a pretty significant restructuring um, in the process of adaptation that moves towards a sense of self-identifying as a disabled person. But what you, um, what you often see are people go through stages that are not unlike the stages of grief. Um, so you'll start with uh, people just refusing to admit what's happened, and then you'll go to people becoming obsessed with the cure, um, and then you'll move on to people just not being sure how they're gonna refocus their life, and then the hope is to, that people get to a place of acceptance. Um, and acceptance is one of the biggest predictors of well-being for um, disabled people. Most people, not everybody, but most people do experience that change, that adaptation, that the move to acceptance. Um, and takes time. Yeah, and five years is about it's about what you see. Um, so when you were talking about ability, I was paralleling a lot with the topic I learned about race. So when thinking about race around like white rage, so basically people like think when people of color advance, it takes away from white power, white privilege, so people get intimidated to that, like, is the discrimination. Do you see that as a big parallel between ability and disability? Like, when someone who is disabled is advancing or getting, doing well, people are like, oh, this is only because of their disability. Like, people parallel to race, like, oh, like, affirmative action or, like, people of color are getting like, this doesn't feel right? That's a great question. Um, I think my best approximation of what you, what you currently see um, is that there's absolutely a structure of prejudice against disabled people, but that it works quite a bit differently. Um, so I think what you often see for disabled people is that uh, we are, uh, one of the things that you often see in the case of disability uh, is um, people finding it hard to Admit that the idea, uh, admit the idea that there's such a thing as ableism. Because like, who doesn't, who doesn't like disabled people? There's like, um, disabled people are sort of like everyone's favorite charity case, right? Um, so um, it's just like, it's like, okay, we know some people don't like black and brown people. That's we we admit that. Um, but who doesn't? Everybody likes disabled people. They're very cute when they're little. Um, and uh, so this, it's difficult to, for people to get their head around the idea that there is prejudice against disabled people. But I think it's interesting then the, the, the form that this takes um, in terms of identifying what prejudice looks like. Um, so forgive me for being political for a moment, but I'm going to. Um, so how many people remember the Fuhrer when Donald Trump mocked the disabled reporter, yeah. So people just absolutely were in a state about this. Um, how could he do this? This is so cruel. And this was sort of, this was this beyond the pale thing that Donald Trump did. The, he, the, um, and part of the language around it was like how like you've mocked the, the most helpless among us. Um, that it, people seemed more upset about this than the horrible things that he had said about women, about uh, immigrants, about people of color, just like all these things. But it was like they mocked a disabled reporter. Um, now, to be clear, that was awful. <laughs> he really should not have done that. But what nobody seemed to be getting up in arms about um, or indeed even aware of, is that Donald Trump and his business has one of the worst records on disability rights and compliance with the ADA. Um, 
of any major businessman currently working in America. Um, he has repeatedly made the claim that uh, disability accommodations are the new, or d uh, disability benefits are the new welfare. Um, he has been sued at least nine times for violations of the ADA. Um, he then <laughs> claimed when he was forced to make some of his buildings compliant with the law, the minimum uh, access for disabled people, he described the money that he spent on this as charitable giving to disabled people. Um, and he appointed as his attorney general someone who spoke on the floor of the Senate against the ratification of the United Nations uh, Treaty on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, um, so the ways in which Donald Trump is actually, not to mention healthcare, right? The ways in which Donald Trump is actually a threat to the lives of disabled people to our ability to survive, our ability to access spaces. He's actually a threat to people's civil rights. Nobody was talking about. Um, and then there was just this one thing where like, oh, how could you be mean? How could you be mean to a disabled person? Don't be mean. Take away their civil rights by all means, but don't be mean. Um, and I think very often we're comfortable with thinking of disabled people as, as a charity case, right? So you should give what you can. Um, and you shouldn't be mean, right? And I think often we think of accommodation in these terms. Uh, so we think of accommodation as stuff that we give to disabled people to make up for their natural deficiencies. Um, so we think of accommodation kind of like as a, as a handout. So it's like, okay, so you, you, you had this unfortunate thing happen to you. Let us help you out. Let us help you out by giving you um, these accommodations that are gonna make things easier for you. So then where I think we find resentment amongst able-bodied people um, is when disabled people start to demand their rights. Um, when they say that, look, no, accommodation is a civil rights issue. Um, accommodation is not making up for individual deficiencies. Accommodation is attempting to redress structural inequality. You give people accommodations because you built the world without thinking about us, and you shouldn't have done that. Um, so accommodations in many cases are personalized attempts to fix a structural problem, which is always gonna be incomplete. Um, but you gotta do something. So I think when disabled people start to become very politicized and demand their rights and to speak about disability in political terms and say, here's what's owed to me, people become very uncomfortable because that's, that's not the attitude of disability that they are comfortable with. I think we're comfortable with the disabled people as asking for a handout and then being extraordinarily grateful when the handout is given. Um, and when people depart from that script, we become uncomfortable. Um, we also, be, I think, are not very comfortable with disabled people who are mad. Um, we like disabled people to be inspirational. We like disabled people to be uh, the people who teach non-disabled people an important lesson. Um, in like movies and films, you always have the disabled people who teach uh, the non-disabled characters an important lesson about life and then preferably die in the third act. Um, and we can move on. Um, and so I think when disabled people depart from that narrative, again, um, we become uncomfortable. Right? So I think there can be elements of resentment, but I think it's, it's very, 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 very different um, than, than, the, than the racial case. And I think there are, there are elements of there are elements of just violence in the racial case that you don't see um, in the case of disability. We see the, the case of disability is always just a little bit more passive. It's like, well, just if there's a killing, letting die distinction, right? Um, we'll, we'll let you die. We'll take your health care. Um, but uh, it's, it's not as violent. It's not as aggressive. It's the sort of, uh, it's the prejudice of pity rather than the prejudice of the sort of aggressive hatred. And I think those are both 
prejudices, but but they're different and they're structurally different. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the um, disabled organizations um, and their really a very successful campaign against this appeal of Obamacare and you know how visual that's been and whether or not you think again it kind of I don't think it, it confirms a stereotype uh, of a healthy person, but then, um, I don't know, what do you think? I, I feel very grateful for them and the, the images of them putting their lives on the line. I, I think it was extraordinary. Um, I think it was extraordinary, and I think it was an example of a group of people coming together and realizing that they have political power. I think it's also a great example of once you once you give a group something, like once you, once, once it was no longer legal to discriminate against disabled people just based on, because it used to, it was so just widely, widely common to discriminate against disabled people just on the basis of pre-existing conditions. Um, and once that became illegal, and then you tried to take it back, what you saw was disabled people becoming politicized en masse um, in a way that I certainly haven't seen in my lifetime. I mean, I was little when the ADA was passed, so I don't remember a lot of that. Um, but I cannot remember seeing that in my lifetime. Um, and I think one of the things that the disability rights movement, um, the disability pride movement, has been really arguing for is trying to get disabled people to see the political dimension of what they struggle with. Because I think, especially this goes back to thinking of disability just as a lack. Very often we're taught as disabled people just to think, to think that all of our struggle is medical. Right? So like everything we struggle with can be fixed by healthcare um, or is in the province of, of healthcare. Um, and I think what, what certainly we saw recently was the awareness of a group of people that a lot of their struggle is political. Um, that their struggle is, is a civil rights struggle um, to be treated as equal under the law um, and that this was an issue of discrimination. Um, and then I think in some cases the protesters were really canny and ADAPT is great about this. They, they will use people's, uh, nobody likes to be mean to disabled people. Um, they will use that stereotype and they will use it all day long if it means getting their health care, right? So they played into that pretty hard. Um, I think they did it pretty successfully. So I still have health care. I'm not mad. Right? Um, sometimes I think um, sometimes I think it can make sense to make strategic decisions like that. And I think in that case, that decision was very strategic and it was very intentional. Um, so it's like, if they're going to feel sorry for you anyways, might as well milk it. Um, so. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, thanks very much for the, the lecture and uh, uh, helping us uh, see uh, uh, ways, uh, how this, uh, uh, have a framework to think about the uh, flourishing and, and well-being well of people uh, with disabilities. And, um, and so, uh, uh, de-emphasize or de-focus uh, less on here. Uh, but I, I wonder if that framework also uh, makes us focus less on cause. Uh, and of course, this isn't the case in all uh, uh, disabilities, but I uh, mean, uh, you know, uh, pollution or food insecurity or uh, workplace injury, war, uh, and all these sorts of things. That um, if, if our focus is on you know, speaking about um, uh, health and well-being and flourishing, uh, mm -hmm. maybe there's less of a political impulse to look at those. I, I think of my father-in-law who uh, lost a hand uh, in a workplace injury, uh, and um, he's flourishing, right? He, he's um, healthy uh, in the sense of sense you were talking about earlier, but uh, it seemed like if there was a language uh, to talk about some, um, something that's wrong, a political language to talk about that, that might be helpful. Yeah, no, I, th I think this is really crucial um, because one of the important things to talk about with disability is the fact that um, often some of the worst things in the world are things that uh, systematically cause disability. So like, you know, war and poverty and also one of the things we have to grapple with is that um, anytime we have in place systems of inequality, 
Um, very often it's like, you know, one of the biggest effects that you see in economic inequality or in, um, unequal distribution or access to resources, you see that play out in disability. So you will see more disabled people amongst the poor people um, than amongst the wealthier people. Um, and you will see um, more bad effects of that. Right? Um, and I think it's absolutely crucial that we be able to have that conversation. Um, so I think one thing is that uh, we need to be able to distinguish between um, the nature of the thing itself and the nature of the thing that caused it. Right. So uh, I think we can say that something is itself not worse off, uh, no, not worse, not not bad, um, and yet can be caused by something bad. It can be caused by something that we think ought to be minimized. Um, in some of these cases, it's pretty easy. So in the case of like. Um, in the case of a lot of disabilities where the disability is acquired, right? um, especially acquired by anybody older than two, right? um, there's a pretty easy argument that says, look, making someone disabled is super wrong, <laughs> even if it's not worse to be disabled. Because what we know empirically, and also just what makes sense, is that it might be fine to be disabled, it is a hell of a thing to become disabled. Um, that is pretty much universally a painful, traumatic, difficult process. Um, and that is unequivocally causing harm to someone, even if they end up fine. So we think if, you're let, if we're given options A and B, right? one is I just leave you alone and let you carry on through your life. And option B is, I interfere with your life extremely, such that your well-being kind of falls off the cliff for a couple of years, but then it comes back. <laughs> a seems better. Um, it's also just, I think, um, it's hard to change your life. And we don't like people to mess with our lives in ways that are beyond our control, the way that becoming disabled is a radical change to your life. Um, things get more complicated if we're thinking just in cases of like lifestyle-related disability, um, that often tracks education, for example, um, or congenital disabilities that might be related to things like pollution or access to resources or that kind of thing. Um, and there, I think the conversation um, just needs to be really careful and nuanced. Um, so I think we can have the conversation about why health inequalities are harmful to people. Um, and why, in general, inequalities can be bad for people without doing what's often done, um, which is using disabled people as like a scare tactic. So you saw that like, after Chernobyl, after the Chernobyl disaster, um, they would just wheel out uh, the various people who had suffered uh, radiation birth defects. They'd be like, this is what happens when nuclear disaster. Tons of bad things happen um, when nuclear disaster, but very often, Disabled people are sort of used as the, the sort of scare tactic. Um, and the same thing happened with thalidomide. Um, and uh, so I think that I think that there we just have to have complicated, careful conversations that don't devalue disabled people, but at the same time um, say systems of inequality. Um, are bad and harmful, and we can talk about the ways that they're systematically harmful across a huge range of areas, um, and say that things that are harmful can cause disability that doesn't automatically make it the case that disability is bad. Um, but it could make it the case that instances of causing disability are instances of injustice, um, and that we should be concerned about that. Um, so a lot of your talk revolved around physical disabilities, mm -hmm. but I was wondering uh, how much of your research could be applied to mental disabilities, or if there's any research that you feel is similar for in the later of mental disabilities. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think it's a, it's a really difficult question. And one of the reasons precisely that I wanted to focus on um, physical disability is that there are basically... <laughs> As the conversation often goes, we tend to divide disability into three categories. Um, so physical, 
psychological or psychosocial, and cognitive. Uh, so you think of psychological or psychosocial as things like uh, depression, uh, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, all of these things, but also autism um, sometimes falls under the heading psychosocial disorder. Um, or psychosocial disability. Um, then there's cognitive disability, which it has to do with like um, mental functioning and mental capacity. So Down syndrome um, is a paradigm example of cognitive disability. Sometimes autism falls under cognitive disability. Um, it is not clear to me, I should start out by saying, but that this tripartite distinction is correct. Okay. Um, it's not typically argued for, it's just something that we assume. But I think one thing that's very clear is that we have this word in English, disability, and we just lump all this stuff together um, and assume that they have some things in common and it's not obvious that, it's not obvious what they do or they don't have in common. Um, and I think a worry about what often happens is that we, talk about physical disability as the paradigm case, and then we just sort of gesture. Um, we're like, oh, and some other stuff too. Right? So this is this, it's a weird type of imperialism. Um, and I definitely didn't want to do that. Right? Um, because I think it's important to appreciate differences where there are differences and not think that just what you might say for physical disability goes for other forms of disability. Um, the other reason why I wanted to focus um, explicitly on physical disability is that in some of these cases I feel like it's an easier test case because a lot of what I'm doing is looking at arguments from testimony, just both from first-person first cases of subjective well-being where psychologists go around and ask people, you, how are you doing? You, how are you doing? Um, and then from cases where people describe their life by a narrative or you know, uh, just make claims about their life and their well-being. Um, and things get more complicated with testimony when we look at psychological or psychosocial disability and when we look at cognitive disability. When we look at cognitive disability, things get really complicated because in a lot of cases we don't have testimony. Um, so we often hear the testimony of caregivers, we hear the testimony of parents, uh, we sometimes don't have the testimony of the person themselves. In the case of psychosocial disability, just to give you an example, um, suppose someone who deals with depression um, says, yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not happy, things aren't going well, I don't, um, but then of course we understand that part of what it is to experience depression is to have a tendency to devalue things. Um, and to have a tendency to, um, you know, be a little bit down about your own uh, state of affairs, as it were. Should that affect how we interpret a person's testimony about their experience of depression? Um, or do we just completely take them at their word? Um, that's really complicated. I don't have a view on that. But that's often a question that won't arise. Um, in the case of um, physical disability, but will arise in the case of uh, psychosocial disability. If you're talking to someone who is bipolar, which testimony should you, uh, should you listen to? Um, you will get different answers at different times about well-being. Um, so I think I think a lot of what I'm saying can be extended, at least in some cases, but I, I don't know how and I don't know to what extent, and I think maybe not always. So I think the autism acceptance movement is a beautiful example of exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about, um, the campaign for acceptance of neurodiversity. For other things, I think depression is a great example where I just don't know what to say. Um, certainly the empirical research tells us that people with depression tend to rate themselves as having poor quality of life. Um, but this is the uh, research that you get just by going around and saying, you, how happy are you? You, how happy are you? And no surprise, people who are diagnosed as having depression don't rate themselves as being uh, all that happy because that's how you get, that's one of the ways that you get diagnosed with depression. Um, what does that mean actually for flourishing or well-being? I think that's a really, really complicated question. 
Um, should we treat all the things that fall under psychosocial disability the same? Should we think that schizophrenia should be lumped in the same category as depression? Um, or is, are, are these sort of fundamentally different experiences? I really, really, really don't know. And I hope that someone who has clearer thinking about this than I do um, can, uh, can do some really good philosophical work on this. Um, because I think these questions are, are fascinating. Um, but I myself don't really have uh, firm opinions on them. Thank you. All right. It's 5.45, so thank you so much.